This show is brought to you by the Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market-leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high-quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com. <laughs> oh, good morning. That's um, where are we? There's something something unusual going on here. There we are. <laughs> oh, I tell you what, what a start to the day. Can only get better from here, right? <laughs> good morning. Welcome to the Garden Gurus Live. I'm Trevor Cochran. We have got another great program for you today, and uh, we will be answering all your garden questions. Um, Sometimes we're asked to leave things alone. I'm going to ask Jimmy to leave that screen alone for us in future. That was pretty funny. Um, we'll be answering your questions. And that was actually one of the photos sent through uh, from some of the questions that have been sent through this morning. So if you have a particular problem with a, a plant and you're struggling to describe it, or you've got a plant that you'd like to have identified, then send us a photograph. It's always a great way to go. On today's show, we've got our good friend David from Garden Express joining us. Um, he's got some quite collectible daisies coming up that you'll just love. Uh, indoor plants remain one of the hottest trends in gardening, and I'll show you how to take care of them. Um, we will be, of course, answering your questions throughout. Please leave your questions in the comments section. Most important, tell me what suburb you're from, what state. It's, uh, it's a very important thing this time of the year because there's so much happening and our climatic conditions are varying quite dramatically. Um, let's have a think about this. Uh, what else have we got? We've got prizes, of course, every week, thanks to our friends at Father Gills, we've got all these amazing seeds, which we will be uh, sh showing um, or sharing with uh, a number of, I think it's five, am I correct, Michaela? Well, ten. Five, ten. Yeah. So we've got ten best questions. We do have a lot of questions coming through, though, so I might just need to uh, belt into um, answering some of them for you straight away. And then as we go along, um, I'll just keep uh, popping some more great information about gardening up on our um, up on our page as well. Here we go. Belinda is in the Gold Coast. Hello, Belinda. I'm about to plant up some raised garden beds and I want to protect our veggies. Should I use five millimetre bird netting over the beds or insect netting? With either one, how do I get pollinators in to do their job? Well, it depends what you're trying to protect them from. So it's one of those things. I've got rabbits at the moment in my garden, and um, I don't want to. I don't want to get rid of the rabbits. I can't bring myself to do that. So I've just put some um, bird netting around the outside of the garden beds, and they're not going in, and it's giving everything a chance to grow. So from that point of view, it's fine. When you put insect netting up, of course, you can't get pollinators in to do the job. So that is a bit of a problem. Um, I would suggest that that you probably don't need to be sticking insect netting up. It would be surprising that you have anything that you'd really want to keep out and maybe you want to look at a couple of deterrents, things like garlic or chilli spray um, to try and keep the, the bugs away, something that's natural. Mike's in North East Melbourne. Um, Mike, g'day, how are you going? I've got a grass tree planted in a half wine barrel. Uh, it's been there for 12 years. Um, the photograph you can see, I think we put the photo up, have we guys? Yes. And um, you can see it is basically a rotten stem or, or branch of a, of a grass tree, unfortunately. Um, and it's probably too late, I would say. Mike, you've asked if you could use a Yates, I think you meant anti-rot. Um, it's a, it's a, a very good treatment for grass trees that have got rot but um, I'm not sure this one's coming back mate I'm sorry that's not great news for you but it's really important if you've got a grass tree and you start to see the the leaves dying back down slowly 
that's the time to hit it with, uh, with the, the, the fungicides to try and stop any fungal infections and rots. These generally occur um, sort of during the winter months, so you will see them start to deteriorate at that period of time. Uh, folks, please do us a favour, hit the like button uh, if you like what we're talking about. If you've got questions, um, make sure you tell us where you're, where you're uh, sending them in from. That's really important. Like uh, Sheree, so Sherry is in Langwarren in Victoria. The grape, ah, so Sh Sherry last week actually asked us about a grapevine and uh, she was describing the leaves like they'd been chewed. Now, in looking at the photograph you've sent through, and I think, again, Jimmy's going to pop that photograph up, um, you'll see something called shot hole. Now, shot hole's an interesting, um, an interesting, not the right one, Jimmy. Um, so it's the four, but it, it's, um, the guys are just having a look to see if, okay, nope, they're trying to sort it out. Um, so shot holes an interesting thing. It causes deformities and what looks like holes have been eaten through the leaves. A lot of people think that's caused by caterpillars, but um, it's not caused by caterpillars at all. In actual fact, it is a um, bacterial infection, so not even a fungus. The interesting thing is the best time to treat this, and you've also got the same problem on your apricots as well. So you've sent some photographs of both through. Best time to treat this um, what is looks like holes being sort of drilled into the leaves and then also some scabbing on the fruit of the apricots uh, best time to treat it is basically as the as the bur the buds are about to burst at the beginning of spring there are some fungicides you can buy in your local garden center that will ease the problem but the real treatment is wait till late winter next year and then apply a lime sulfur spray followed about a week later with a copper spray, followed about a week later with a lime sulfur spray. And the combination of those sprays will clear off the bacteria. So effectively, what you want to do is sterilise the bacteria and it will, um, it'll fix that. Sorry, we couldn't get you the photo up, folks, but don't worry, it's okay. Um, I, I think that question has probably been answered quite well. And if you've got any questions, give us a call back. Um, with uh, with some more photos. Now, Dennis is in Sydney, Western Suburbs. I'm about to separate my bromeliads. Want to know, is orchid mix okay to use in pots? Actually, orchid mix is fine with bromeliads. Most of them, it depends on what they are because a lot of them are epiphytic. So they don't really need an awful lot, which is why kind of orchid mix, uh, the big chunky version of it is, uh, is actually ideal. But my... Um, my suggestion would be that that's probably the best way to go. So Dennis, yeah, go with the orchid potting mix. That'll do the job and they should take off. Now, Christine joins us pretty much every week. It's great to have you with us, Christine. She's in Stirling in, uh, in WA. Uh, I've got a large stag elk that needs dividing. Is it okay to divide now? Yes, all right, because these sorts of... Um, these sorts of... Uh, uh, well, what they are is they're actually ferns tend to start pushing out, flushing out new shields, new leaf uh, in the next two months or so. So if you're going to do it, do it straight away and um, and then get them onto their new backing boards. Give them a bit of a water with uh, something like sea salt. It's obviously not a fertiliser, but it is going to help them sort of recover from any shock and uh, they should take off and be doing pretty well. Elizabeth is in Sydney. Hello, Elizabeth. I've got a brown bug which hops in my lemon balm and marjoram and... What can I do to stop them? Spit. Okay, so we're looking at that photograph now. So you can see there, there's little beetles there, and, and beetles can be quite, they can actually do this scarifying thing where they chew off the outside edge of the leaf, which you end up with all these sort of scarified leaves. You can see the what is effectively the, the skeleton of the structure of the foliage, but all the green has been eaten away. And there's a few different bugs. It's a bit hard for me to identify that one specifically, but there's a few different bugs that do that this time of the year. And the best treatment, well, there's a number of different treatments. What you might be able to do, though, with something like lemon balm um, is to actually dust over, just using a, a sulphur dust, and that should be enough to uh, to take care of those those beetles. They don't like sulphur at all, and they will move away. So I would do that, and you'll break the cycle. That should help. Now, Wendy is in Melbourne. Husband has divided a bamboo back in August, September, and then they died back. Is this normal? 
or should we have done something different? Wendy, um, not an unusual thing for the bamboo to die back. What I would do is soak the ground around the base of it with sea salt. Um, it will bounce back. You should see some regrowth uh, in those stems. So very unusual, unless it was left out to be dry. Um, it would be, uh, if it was like dried out, it could deteriorate. But as long as you're, you've got lots of moisture around those roots, you'll find it'll recover. Interestingly enough, bamboos do take a fair bit of time to, um, to actually um, recover from transplant shock. But once they take off, they're fantastic. Okay, uh, Karuthika from Sydney, good morning to you. I've got some potted plants on my balcony, repotting plants, um, curry leaf and mint are always wilting or not growing much. I propagated mint in water and then potted them and the curry leaf plant was bought in store. Um, I've tried to add compost and since it's summer, I water them daily. On the other hand, succulents are growing well. What am I doing wrong? I suspect it's your potting mix. Um, that's usually the single biggest cause of problems. What you're looking for is a really good red tick. So I always use that Osmocote Professional. And you can buy, there's two, two types. There's one in a blue bag, one in a, uh, an orange bag. Either one of them are fantastic for plants like curry leaf um, or herbs. You know, literally herbs will grow anywhere as long as the moisture is being kept in there. And if you're having to water daily at the moment, it suggests that maybe you need to upgrade the potting mix. So that's what I would recommend you do. Um, hopefully that helps. Uh, let's have a look. Mika is in Melbourne. Hello, Mika. I've got a nectarine tree and it's got a disease on its leaves. What is it and how do I treat it? Okay, so this is like a curly leaf um, disease and uh, it's it's commonly known as, um, as uh, a peach uh, blistering um, disease. It's it's actually, uh, interestingly enough, it's caused by bacteria again. So this is another one, one of those diseases, or, or it is a disease that should be treated in the winter. So just as the new buds are about to burst, you apply a copper-based spray over it. And there's a number of them. Uh, Cosite is a very good one in controlling this particular pest. Um, so my suggestion would be that you probably let the tree grow out of it. You can pick those twisted leaves off and um, that peach leaf curl will disappear. So that's, um, that's really the only solution I've got for you, Mika. There's not really a spray that you could apply just at the moment that's really gonna make that much of a difference. A lot better, just pick off those leaves. The new foliage that'll flush through will be a lot better. Give them a feed, it won't hurt them and that'll get them growing strongly and, and get that new growth coming through. Um, Okay, let's keep moving because we've got lots and lots of questions coming through. Fiona is in Serpentine. Serpentine's here in Western Australia. It's in the sort of the, the Perth Hills, the foothills. Um, Fiona's devastated to find her weeping birch. It's six years old and it's dying. They found it, found it on Friday with the leaves, leaves have died. What can I do to save it? Well, you know what? Generally, it's a sign of one or two things if they die this time of the year. Uh, they've dried out, which is pretty unusual because it's still been, soil moisture levels are pretty good in Perth. Uh, two is that you could have borers in around the base of the plant. And you'll see literally holes drilled into the side of the of the base of the birch. Um, what can you do to save it? Well, probably right at the moment, I would recommend that you get some sea soil and you soak the ground around the base because what you're trying to do is to get some regrowth of the roots and stimulation of, of root activity, which is what sea soil does. So it helps lots of plants when they... Um, when they um, get some kind of damage like that. And Barty, I'm not sure where Barty's from, but she says, my plants die whenever I repot them. I'm not able to understand what I'm doing wrong. Well, Barty, it's probably the same thing going on here. Root damage, um, when you repot, you do damage the roots. So you do have to be very gentle with the, the root system. Pop them into the new soil, make sure you've got a good potting mix or and give it a good water, but water it with that sea soil in it. So this seaweed extract is rich in a whole bunch of different things, but plant hormones that seal off damaged roots and encourage regrowth of those roots. So Barty, your problem and solution is probably very similar to Fiona's in Serpentine. I'm not optimistic for your weeping birch, Fiona. Once they start to die off, generally they die off. So it's not too good. Um, Jenny, you're in southeast Victoria. Thanks so much for joining us. We've had a lot of rain and all my fruit trees have developed curly leaf. Can I treat with Yates curly leaf spray now that the trees have blossoms and fruit? Um, the answer is you can treat them for sure. Um, the, 
the question would be whether it's really going to make much of a difference at the moment. As soon as the moisture levels dry out, um, the, the trees will grow uh, grow away and, and that, uh, that, that peach leaf curl, which is what you're seeing, um, will be solved. And as I said, anything like co-side or any of those copper sprays are generally more than enough. But um, you don't want to apply them on very soft, tender new foliage because you'll burn it. Hopefully that helps. The key with this disease is to treat in the late winter, early spring, just as new growth starts to arrive. Melanie is in Shoalhaven in New South Wales. I'm not an experienced green thumb, but have purchased a dahlia tuber. Can these be planted in a pot? And if so, what size do you recommend? It's a good question because it depends on what type of dahlia you have, Melanie. Um, what I would suggest is that you'd want to look at about a 30 centimetre wide pot. So that's generally the ideal size. Pop your, your dahlia tuber in the middle and, and I'd suggest you have a couple of stakes on hand because usually uh, dahlias will grow up and, and often if they've got those big pom-pom flowers, they'll need to be staked as well. But look, that's all you need to do. Make sure you put them in a really good potting mix. Again, the key to success is potting mix. If you've got a really good quality, the red tick, look for that Osmocote brand. You can't go wrong with that. You'll find you'll get the growth that you need and you'll get the results. If it's a cheap potting mix and it's still composting down, it'll actually take nutrient away from your plants. They generally never grow to their full potential. Jan is in Kalamunda, um, back over here in the west. Hi, Jan. Um, let's have a look here. I've, number, I've numerous large golden canes that we oh that we were given and have temporarily put into the ground. Um, they've bunched bunched them up in, in large deep holes. The ground's clay and underground water seepage is significant. Should we cut them right back? Some are three meters tall. Um, really, the key here is probably it's not the water is the issue because you've you've damaged the root. So um, extra water is probably something that they'll really love and and want, but. Um, what we what we really probably want to do is probably reduce some of the foliage. Don't cut them back because these are these are going to produce a, a growth stem out the top, and if you cut that off, that's the end of that particular plant, unless it suckers up some some branching um, side shoots underneath. Uh, I would take off the old foliage, probably up to just maybe two or three leaves on the top, and I would soak the ground with sea salt. That's the only thing I would do. As the weather gets warmer, probably November, December, I'd make sure that they're in their permanent home ready to go. Margaret is in Port Broughton in the Upper York Peninsula. Wow, that's great. Thanks for joining us, Margaret. Um, I was given a small plane tree, but it's not doing very well in our sandy soil. Um, I put compost and uh, and a Tro four day tablet in the hole when I planted it to compensate, but it's still struggling. What can I do to help it thrive? Okay, well, look, right at the moment, it should be just starting to grow away. It's really only just coming out of its winter dormancy. So my suggestion would be that give it a little bit of time. You've put compost in, you've put Tro four day in. Um, the only other thing you might want to think about is a soak, again, of sea salt. We're hearing that a lot this morning, um, but it is a very good solution. Those seaweed extracts are brilliant in getting the most amazing recovery results from any root damage that's done, which is what happens when we're doing transplanting. Okay, I wanted to talk to you about, speaking of transplanting, a lot of us are repotting our potting mix, uh, our uh, indoor plants at the moment in a potting mix, and a lot of us are looking for new growth. In fact, I noticed um, with some indoor plants that Bonnie was working on on the weekend on the garden gurus that it's a bit of yellowing and that's not an unusual thing at the end of the winter there's a bit of yellowing coming on the leaf so stimulating growth is really important and now as the weather warms if you can support the plant with nutrients um, the plant will grow to its optimum potential which is exactly what we want with indoor plants so how do you get the right mix of nutrients well you've got to get a specialized fertilizer and this was voted Australia's product of the year last year when it comes to guard products and for a very good reason um, it's a pre-mixed liquid fertilizer it's called pour and feed and all you do is you just shake it open the the lid which is actually your your cup to tell you how much you need to use you pour it in then you pour that over the the soil ideally of the plant and it will actually stimulate the most amazing root growth. Um, and as such, as a consequence, really good foliage growth. Now it's a carefully um, balanced out mix. Um, just to give you a bit of an idea, one of those caps is perfect for the larger size pots. So those sort of 10 centimeter pots, which 
a lot of indoor plants tend to be in those larger pots. But if you've got a little tiny one, those smaller size pots, then you probably only want about half a cap. But what you will see is incredible growth. They really do grow really quickly. And the results are noticeable within about seven days. That's what's amazing about this. So there's no mess, no fuss. You just pour it directly onto the soil. And if you want to get great results out of indoor plants, then this is what you need to be looking for right now and applying it on a weekly basis. So every seven days, and you're gonna see over the next three months or so, the next 12 weeks, you'll probably use the whole bottle by that period of time, but the results you'll have will be spectacular. And it's suitable for all sorts of indoor plants, even ferns. So a lot of people, things like, um, and this is a good example, but things like um, uh, bromeliads, uh, some of those larger, um, more unusual plants, uh, staghorns, elkhorns, they all love it, as well as your traditional, you know, your fiddle figs, your spathophyllums, dracaenas, the devil's ivy. Um, palms are really good. They love this. And some of those softer plants, the peperomias, so those really succulenty ones, peperomias and um, St. Pauli or African violet, violets are, they just love this. Small amount every week and you will get great results. Plants are like us. They feed small amount every single day and if you get the right nutrients every day you end up growing big and strong that's exactly what we want with them so how's that we've been going pretty well so far and we're uh, we're only about halfway through um we have got some more questions to answer but please do us a favor as we're going through hit the like button it's a, a really good way for you to um share it with your friends and uh, and get them participating and uh, i have got a number of questions flowing through like uh, Delicia in Tweed Heads. In Tweed Heads. Um, I've got tiny pure white insects with lots of legs on my gardenia. What are they and what's the best treatment? Well, Delicia, more often than not, um, the best thing to do is to send us a, um, a photograph because it could be one of two things. The first one is that you could just have on the soft growth you could have a little white, um, what we call a white fly. So you notice these guys will actually fly around. But if it's a little woolly and you can see those legs and it looks a little bit on the woolly side, it, and it's probably more likely to be this, what you've actually got is something called mealybug. And mealybug is quite a significant pest and quite a significant problem. You have to be a bit careful with that one because once it gets down into the soil or into the leaf nodes or into plants that things like um, uh, agapanthus or any of the bulbs, it's almost impossible to get rid of. So treat it now and use a systemic insecticide. Now, there are a number of them out there. Um, MaxGuard is one that um, you might still find in Mitre 10 stores, etc. Perfect. You spray it over the foliage. It's taken in and um, it's systemic. So it's flowing through the sap. These insects are suckers. So they'll suck on the sap. And as they're doing that, what you'll find is um, they'll ingest that insecticide and uh, that'll bring a control. So hopefully that helps now consuelo you are in warunga in sydney and you've got a really interesting question your lemon myrtle is losing its leaves and the leaves are turning a very gray color what do i recommend please well it's very unusual that, that would occur and i'm not sure what your weather's been like but it could be one of two things going on here one is if it's too wet they do lose their um their sheen they don't have that dark green gloss they start to get a bit of a, <coughs> excuse me, a bit of a grey colour. Um, that could be a problem. I'm not 100% sure. What I would suggest, though, is you send us a, a bit of a photograph. The other thing is that, um, so too much water, not enough water. And if it's if it's not enough water and they've got something like um, red spider mite, it'll cause almost a silvering of the foliage and they will drop their leaves as a consequence of that. So if that's what it sounds like, it may need to have, again, a systemic insecticide applied to it. I'm not 100% sure, but um, I would suggest, Consuela, that you send us, a, um, send us a photograph. That would be very helpful, and I can be a little more, more precise with that. Uh, Thelma is from South Gippsland in Victoria. Slaters are eating our vegetable seedlings. Help. Um, Thelma, you need to get a lot of organics out in your veggie patch. So... Slaters, will, they prefer to eat um, dead material, so organic material that's rotting, so thick um, compost or even straw, they will go to that before they'll eat your veggies. But 
um, when they're short of, of those organics, they'll start eating green materials. So one is change the diet, so encourage them to go to some of those organics, so throwing some of that around the outside. Um, as far as control goes, there's a really simple, it's an old fashioned one, and that's to get oranges, halves, and to cut them in half and squeeze the juice out. And when you do that, um, what you can do is um, take the halves just on dusk and lay them around the areas where there's a lot of slaters. Now, leave it for about an hour or so, and when you come back, you'll find on the inside of the oranges, the acid is really appealing to slaters, and they'll come straight to it, and they'll start eating all the insides, and you can literally take them, pop those halves into a plastic bag, and pop them in the bin, or even better, give them to the chooks, because chooks love them. Hopefully that helps. Um, Katharina, I'm not sure where you are from, Katharina. That's um, a bit of a challenge for us when you ask me a question like this. I have a plant called Big Red, and they have pimples on the new growth. Do I cut off all the areas with this problem or just leave it alone? I would love to see if some photographs of this because I'm not sure what your Big Red is. There are a lot of a lot of plants that have um, the nickname Big Red um, and they vary dramatically it's from tomatoes through to begonias. So I really need to see a photograph and I really need to know where you're from too, Katharina. So please let us know, folks, where you're from and hit like on uh, on the uh, on your page as well as you're going through. Okay, Myrtle is from Wallet in Victoria. Hello, how can I get rid of snails and spiders? Plenty of spider webs on the fence. It's been eating my almond tree leaves and ate all my eggplant. I'm, that's gotta be the snails doing that. And look, you know, snail baits, I'm really reticent to recommend them. Snails themselves are something that have no tolerance because they're a mollusk, not an insect as such. They have no tolerance of um, of copper. So if you were to put a, a spray of something like coside up the, the branch, up the trunk of your almond tree and in uh, an arc around the outside of your eggplant seedlings, you could spray over them, it won't hurt them. Uh, you will take full control of those um, of those snails and slugs. Uh, bluestone is also, it's a type of copper and that's something that once upon a time would be used and just sprinkled around the outside. Again, very effective control of, um, of snails. As far as spider webs go, look, spiders will come and go. So the birds will start picking the spiders off in the next month or so. You'll see them start to disappear. Um, but spiders are a fantastic control of so many different pests and they're a sign of a healthy garden myrtle. So my suggestion would be leave the spiders alone. Don't. The only way you're going to control them is one of those sprays and I just don't think you need to do it personally. It's up to you. Uh, Joe is in Melbourne. Hello, Joe. I'd like to know if sea salt is enough goodness for my veggie garden. Should I be adding other products? It's not enough. No, absolutely not, Joe. You do need to use fertilizers. Sea salt is not a fertilizer. It's really good for transplant shock. What I would recommend you do is that you take a look at getting a complete all-round fertilizer. And there's some terrific fertilizers for veggie gardens. And the guys from Osmocote have got a couple of rippers that are a mixture of Osmocote and some organics put it all together with some special ingredients and they just cause your veggies to jump out of their skin. So my suggestion would be head down to the local garden centre, grab yourself some, I would suggest Osmocote plus organics and get it into your veggie patch. Karen is in Newcastle. I have three peonies and they're growing really good. Do you think they'll flower in... Yeah, I do think here in Newcastle. Yes, absolutely, Karen. Um, I just put some into my garden not that long ago. I got them from Garden Express and they were fantastic. They've taken off. They're really starting to grow. I'm not sure whether they'll flower in their first year, but certainly I expect in their second year they'll do very, very well. So I'm not sure how new they are, but peonies are beautiful and they're worth persevering with. If you've got them growing, um, that's the first step. Once they've sort of matured a little bit, you'll get some really, really good results. Okay, wow, we are flying at it. We're getting so many questions. Keep sending them through. I'll keep answering them for you. Um, but how about we have a look at what's coming up on the Garden Gurus this week? I've got a DIY project that your poo will love. It's straightforward to construct and made from recycled products. Tune in to the Garden Gurus this weekend for more details. I love it. Isn't Wooly cute? Um, 
It's great to have Darren Senor back joining the team. Um, Darren's a very talented landscaper and obviously he's hosted a, a number of these as well, these sessions, and um, extremely knowledgeable plants man, Darren. But he's got a couple of projects and that particular project um, was for the benefit of Wooly, who happens to be Lawrence R. Cameraman's dog. And Wooly's been uh, on sets on and off over many, many years now. He deserved finally to star in, in a little story all on his own. You'll get to see more of that um, this coming weekend when we're back with another episode of The Garden Gurus. Now, we do have an opportunity. I'm going to go through a few questions and we're going to catch up with my mate David Van Berkel. Um, this is, let's, we're going to go and do a couple of questions in Melbourne for a start. And um the first one we're going to go to is angela in melbourne hello angela what do you think about charlie carp liquid fertilizer look, look it's the fish emulsion and fish emulsion is really good for many of those plants that love high p so high phosphorus um so my mum in back in the old days back in the 70s and 80s when hanging baskets were in she used to grow a lot of ferns and everybody raves about the results they get with ferns and fish emulsion it's the high pea sitting in that fish emulsion um, so if you've got those kinds of plants definitely use it it's fantastic it's a little bit on the smelly side a lot of the time but that doesn't mean that um that it's not good it's usually an indicator that that it is really really good for you um or for your plants anyway Matthew is in Melbourne as well. Um, how big must a Waratah be before planting? Um, have a chance to buy one in 14 centimetre pot. You plant them straight away, Matthew. Um, they do best. Look, my, my view with Waratahs is they're best in the ground. I had a few in my garden. They struggled a bit, but but we're in, in a lot drier summer conditions and Waratah is used to um, quite wet summers, obviously um, originating from the outer regions around the outside of Sydney and north. So what you really want to do is just um, make sure you've got the moisture kept up to it. I would, the one thing they don't like is a lot of root damage. I would get it to the ground as quickly as you can and let it get going and it should do pretty well. Mary in Brisbane, now you've got a very good question, Mary. Um, this is one that I don't feel that I can answer 100% accurately for you. Is there a systemic insecticide that won't kill bees? Well, the answer is any insecticide is going to kill insects and bees that come in contact with with that insecticide are likely to be impacted. But what Mary's referring to is, um, is Comfidor uh, was a product that it comes from a family of chemicals that have been associated with bee kills um, internationally. And um, a major retailer here, Bunnings, made a decision not to carry any of the plants that come from that particular family of chemicals because it was believed that what the chemicals were doing was not so much killing the bees but affecting their radar so they couldn't find the, the beehive. So they would go off and do their foraging but couldn't find their way home. Now, it's all speculation because it's never been formally proven and that's one of the big challenges here. Systemic insecticides are vitally important when it comes to controlling some of those pests like mealybug, etc. There are some natural predator solutions starting to become available and that's where you jump on those websites like uh, the good bug um, site and so on then they might be you might be able to find some predators that'll help you in that space but um, at the moment the trick with insecticides broadly is use little as little as possible but if you've got something like mealy bug and it's a, a plague proportional or red spider mite um, it, if, you, if you've got no other option, I would be applying that sort of treatment. Um, the guys from the Good Bug sites, one of those uh, organisations, they would be saying to you, uh, definitely go for the insects, but sometimes it can take a fair bit of time to get those predatory insects up at the right balance. So if you're going to do it, do it now. Go and get them now. Jump online. You can order them. They're delivered to you in the mail. It's a good way to go. Telly is in Lithgow in New South Wales. So I've just bought a property which includes a relatively steep bank that goes down to a creek, which I would like to plant out. It's got trout, yabbies, lizards, etc. Do you have any recommendations of what I could use to plant it out and to replace the grass and the weeds? It has to be frost tolerant. Okay. Um, First thing that comes straight to mind is that you would go for what we call kidney weed or dichondra. Perfect for, for retaining and for holding a bed. You could put grasses in there, okay? So when I say that, I'm talking about the native grasses. So there's a whole bunch of different ones that are available. They would all be very good for achieving the same thing again. Um, grass itself is actually not a bad thing to have. 
Um, it really is a wonderful absorber of excess nutrients. It takes it all up before it ever has a chance to flow into a stream. So if you're gonna go for um, some of the native grasses, then I would, you know, I'd plant them quite densely and, and allow them to act the same way. If it's a traditional grass and it just means you've got to mow it and you don't like doing that, um, fair enough, I understand. Uh, but my suggestion would be that you take a look at something like that or go for that recommendation I had before and that's Dichondra kidney weed. Gabby is in Rosebud in Victoria. Hi, Gabby. Um, I'm looking for an ornamental flowering cherry tree. As a centrepiece, what would you recommend? Well, look, being from Perth, I've got to tell you, we're not the kings of flowering cherry trees. It just happens to be that I have a few in my garden um, and, and they do relatively well. They're, they're quite small still. Um, I don't think I have a particular favourite. What I would recommend you do, though, is you jump in your car and you head out to uh, somewhere like Garden World and have a look at the range because there's got to be at least 30 different species or varieties of flowering cherry and sometimes it'll really just get down to what color you like some of them are quite dark um, almost strawberry color and then some of them are white and it really gets down to what you like but it, it, as a centerpiece i'd probably look at a weeper um, there's a beautiful one called mount fuji um, it's it's very upright it's got a beautiful habit uh, does very very well in victoria doesn't do super well in my garden unfortunately but um, it's up to you it is a personal thing i hope that helps james is in mahogany creek now that's here in wa why don't i get daffodils bloom anymore i followed advice and lifted the bulbs replanted the biggest ones in new bulb mix plants came up but no flowers so james what we do see a lot of is the need for um for bulbs to be chilled. Now, uh, the chill factor is probably the issue that you've got. We haven't had, we've had quite a mild winter. It's been a lot of rain, not as frosty and as cold. In fact, it's been quite frosty at the tail end, which is really not gonna do your DAFs any good at all. You really want it to be cold at the beginning. Now, there is a cheat that we all have in the garden world, and that is we take, um, we take certain plants and we sort of give them the conditions they want. Bulbs are a good example where they're taken out of the ground and they're put into a chiller or a crisper. You don't want them to be frozen, but maybe sitting at two to four degrees for a period of four weeks or so will trigger the, the flowering process on daffs and tulips and some of those other spring flowering bulbs that are a little bit cold sensitive. They want cold weather. So you could cheat it. So when you dig them next year, um, there's no problem with them producing lots of foliage because what they're doing currently now is putting all that energy into the bulbs so your bulbs will be bigger and they'll be ready to go. They're just looking for that cold weather. Um, I can tell you that it took me a few years of cheating with my um, with my cherry tree at home, my cherry trees, um, to the point where one winter every week I would go and get a couple of bags of solid ice and throw that solid ice in around the base of the plant so that I was chilling down the soil and that year I ended up with 30 or 40 kilos of cherries, whereas the previous year I had none. So we can kind of manipulate the environment to our advantage if we're, um, if we're sort of tricky about it. And that's basically what you're gonna to have to do, James, if you wanna see lots of daffodils coming into flower. Lydia is in Melbourne. I have a diam diamantina agatha. It's lost all its leaves and why has this happened? And I don't know what the answer is, Lydia. I would love to see a photograph of this. Um, maybe you could send that in to us and we'll have a squeeze and I'll come back and answer it because it shouldn't lose its leaves, not now. Uh, it should be looking pretty good. It just depends on where it is, what the conditions are. Send that in. I'll do my best to help you out. Megan is in Queensland. Hello, Megan. Um, it's lovely to have you join us this morning. We're building in Moor Park Beach and starting a garden from scratch. It's very sandy and we'll have spray, uh, so sea spray, oh, spray area from septic. You don't want to plant grass. What are the best plants? Okay, so you, you basically, you've got a situation that I have as well. So I have a, I have a, um, a black water system that treats um, the sewage to double A standard water. So it's not quite drinking water, definitely not what you want to ingest in any way. Um, but what I've done is I've, I've drip fed it to a number of trees all around my garden, um, specifically fruit trees, and uh, they suck up all the excess nutrients. Um, it, it's never a real big issue from my point of view. I would suggest that you'd be looking at 
maybe being a little more direct with your delivery and you can do that through drip systems and putting drippers all around the outside of trees and then connecting them to polytube is a great way to go, um, particularly in sandy soil. I hope that helps. Now, we have been going flat out and I am not the only one who has been going flat out because David Van Burkel would be the hardest working man I reckon around. G'day mate, how are you? Uh, I'm not too bad, Trevor. I, I think you might be lying about that one today. It's my birthday tomorrow and I'm about to uh, sneak off from here and open a bottle of wine, would you believe? <laughs> oh, I, I'd believe it. What, what is it? Is it quarter past 10 in the morning over there at the moment? It's oh, normal time for wine. Come on, come on. <laughs> that mate but uh but your topics today are sensational i, I want to get involved in four or five of those uh mm. first prunus i have a row of prunus elvins the the, the flowering cherries yeah beautiful, beautiful compact bush as far as a cherry goes upright bracts uh, and stems uh, just the most delicious and and floriferous uh cherry yep. that i've seen mate so that's a beautiful one there it is a uh, ripper yeah you're spot on with the bulbs as well with with the cooling and I heard of a lady once in Darwin who uh, who put the ice on her tulips to get cut flowers for her local florist. So it's yeah. <laughs> certainly do it when you're not alone there. But yeah. unfortunately, we've got to do the opposite. And uh, I bought a Bismarckia palm trev, which, as you know, is very tropical. And yep. uh, the first two years, I was out there every night with a, um, with a felt heater bag uh, over the top of it just to keep it warm. And then yep. cork loop during the uh, the early months of spring, and then I released it in summer to uh, to the bright light. So still going well. Is it, I was going to say, is it going well? Because Bismarckia is one of those beautiful, beautiful plants. It's an incredible palm. Yeah, oh, beautiful blue hues, and uh, I think I'm onto my uh, ninth leaf, which is not in, in five years. But um, hey, I haven't killed it, so I'm loving it. Well, it just goes to show that you, you can manipulate the environment. I always remember many years ago, I was doing a radio talkback show over here in Perth. And one morning, a guy rang up and told me that he was growing coconuts at home and wanted some advice. And I said, no, it can't be coconuts. Maybe it's a cocos palm. And he said, no, 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 it's coconuts. Anyway, I said to him, well, look, I'd, I'd love to come and have a look at it because he lived not far from me. So I literally drove and had a five acre property. And as I was driving up his driveway ahead of me was a coconut growing. Now, coconuts will not grow in Perth. So I literally, I just about drove off his driveway and into a tree. I was so shocked. And then I got out and I walked over and I said to him, how on earth did you make that happen? Because it actually had coconuts on the on the plant as well. And, and standing looking at the palm and he said, well, I'm a plumber and I took some copper pipe from my hot water system and I wrapped it around the roots when I planted the, the coconuts into the ground. And every time we turn hot water on, it warms the soil up and they love it. And it's the only way. Talk about cheating though, right? Well, my wife thinks I'm crazy. We've got a wood heater in our atrium, and I wanted to do the same thing. I'm not a plumber, but I figure mm -hmm. if I put pipes into the earth, I could grow some really tropical-looking things. So I'm yep. going to take that piece back to her, and so I should have done it. <laughs> David, um, just before we talk about your plan of the week, um, I wanted to ask you, you had phenomenal take-up on, on that spectacular caladium um, Thai beauty. Tell us about it. Yeah, look, the, the Thai beauty was uh, was just a, such a pleasure to be involved with. And I think, you know, the excitement of what we're just talking about, about people uh, being able to grow some strange things in unique places or particularly bringing some, some things to this country that maybe we haven't had before. And um, so the Caladiums, they, they, we almost sold out, Trevor. I think we've got 30 or 40 left uh, for wow. this year which is just phenomenal. And I, and I thank the viewers for their uptake and enthusiasm as well because it's wonderful as a, as a gardener and a businessman to uh, be able to bring these beautiful stories to people and then have them enjoy it just as much. Well, look, the thing that I, I liked about that so much was that this was so special. And if you're a horticulturalist, you, you have a great appreciation for those special things. And, and you made it, you know, you created this signature collection, I think, which is now people can start to collect, you know, the things that, that are horticulturalist who, who, you know, lives and breathes and loves plants, um, considers to be the best of the best. And, and that's obviously just one of them. So there's a lot more coming down through the pipeline, I think, in the future, isn't there, David? Absolutely. Well, just getting my head around some of those things, you know, it isn't always about the rarest plant, Trevor, but I think sometimes there's you know, maybe old historic plants that we hear our grandparents or our great-grandparents have been growing 
Uh, we actually have a plant maybe coming to us that was brought to Australia in the 1800s. And um, wow. so certainly going to hit the signature collection. Uh, and then a few others. I'm not sure if you heard of the forest lily, Trevor. It's, it's out and about there, but it strikes me as one of, you know, one of my just favourite plants for foliage, the length of flowering time, um, the colour of the bloom. Um, so we've got a lot coming on, mate. It's, uh, it's going to be exciting. And um, that Puya from the Andes, you sent me a photo through earlier on. I did, I've definitely got my hand up for one of those when they're online as well. I know. I don't know when that one's coming through, but I thought that must be a new Gymea lily. Um, mm -hmm. you know, beautiful big tall stems, but more of a grass boy kind of base to it, I think. So, um, yeah, I'm really excited to, uh, to bring that one in a few years, I think. Now, David... It's springtime. Colour is everything at the moment, and probably um, you know, probably of of all the plants that really herald spring, outside of the spring flowering bulbs, the marguerite daisies are are the ones that are so popular. But there's been so much work done on breeding them in recent years to the point where some some of the flowers are just mind blowingly good. And you guys have, have identified some, right? Yes, of course. Uh, you know, traditionally they would sort of. Um, spring up and, and get quite leggy and, you know, beautiful numbers of blooms always, but, but could be quite tall and straggly. So yep. the breeding has been about bringing that compactness to, um, to the variety. So we have what we call a summit series, which has been mm. bred for huge numbers of flowers, uh, disease resistance, which normally they are quite resistant to diseases anyway, um, mm. but also it's, it's called basal um, shooting. So from the base of the plant, you get this really compact form that gets more width than height to it. So yep. yeah, beautiful, beautiful daisies. I've got a, a few samples here of what we'll be shipping out. Oh. Or blooming. That's how desperate they are to get away, Trev. They're sweet. That's a sweet little plant, that one there. That, they'd be great. You could sort of plant them in sort of little clusters together to bring out big, you know, splashes of colour popping out of your garden or possibly even look at lining fences or garden beds with them. Absolutely, yeah. Just sitting above a sleeper wall along a driveway, something like that, sort of about 50 to 60 centimetres in, um, in width. So a f just a few plants will, will give you this beautiful run of colour. We have them in individual colours, always the collection of, of three being a, a lemon, white and a red. Right, okay. Okay, now tell us a little bit about the deal because um, it's a pretty red hot price you've got going for these guys. Yep, so we're normally valued at, uh, at 25 bucks, and we've got, uh, for viewers, $20, saving 20%, Trevor. Wow, so that's three of them delivered um, direct to your door. This is pretty important for many of us that are still in lockdown. We can actually get them delivered at home uh, and obviously uh, plant them when we want uh, without obviously having to get up and go off to the garden centre. So this is the what uh, they're often called Federation Daisy as well um, or the old days they used to be called Marguerites. Not so much these days and I think it's because of that breeding but these specific ones are the Summer Summit series, right? Yep, the Summit series. Yep, for sure, Trevor. And, and as you said, um, Federation Days are probably the, the, the better analogy. I think a lot of people go to that Blue Marguerite now for a Marguerite Daisy, which is uh, yep. you know, completely different. But, um, yeah, loads and loads of blooms. I was going to say millions of blooms, maybe a bit of an exaggeration, but uh, lots of colour and for the entirety of spring and well into summer. Now, David, I know that um, it's it's rare. I know you're desperate to get off, and, and obviously with a birthday coming up, you know it's 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 important to let you go. I know, but usually you've got Rowan not too far away from you. Um, one thing I wanted to mention: I'm about to start talking about these because I've been growing them at home. I don't know whether you can see. Um, you look at it and you go, what are they? They are um, a range of shiitake and oyster mushrooms, and they are so pungent and aromatic and flavoursome that Michaela is sitting across from me, and you'll appreciate this, basically dry reaching, because she's, she's, not, she's not got the strongest uh, stomach, and she, you know, she, could, um, she could smell something uh, that had gone off in Peru, I think, from here with, without any problems. The, these are something that you can buy in kits, and I thought maybe I um, might suggest to Rowan that uh, he looks at getting his hand on some of these kits, because after I've talked about these, not only will Michaela be looking for them, everybody's going to be looking for them. So I, I mentioned it to Rowan now. Don't let me forget to hook you up with the guy that's that's producing them. Thanks, mate. Look, I, I appreciate that one. We've done the shiitake, a, a single shiitake kit once before. The problem is those things want to grow so quickly. By they the do. time they arrive at home, 
to the to the gardener they're already growing. So uh, yeah. if you're going to push us on that track, please viewers be aware that they'll, they'll be growing out of the box when they get them. You could be harvesting as soon as they've arrived, which is it's not a bad much thing. Like that, isn't it? You know, once they're yeah. set off, they're they're incredible. But uh, yeah, they are. They are. Like, I'm not a fan, but um, yeah, hold on. <laughs> David, um, great deal. It's um, 20 bucks for three sensational um, Federation daisies, we'll call them, uh, those those beautiful colours. Uh, people can just place their order by going straight to gardenexpress.com.au, right? Yep, and look out for these pocket rockets, Trevor. They are just fantastic. They're raring to go. And as you say, heralding spring. So as I just held them up with the blooms already on them, um, you couldn't get a quicker result in your garden. And, folks, it's the big four or five for David, so make sure you send him uh, a happy birthday wish as well, all right? I wish, mate, I wish, but that's right. <laughs> <laughs> go, and, go, and have a, uh, go and have a glass of wine, mate. It's lovely catching up with you. Thanks for joining us. Indeed. Thank you very much. Happy birthday. Thanks a lot. Right. Well, shall we? I wasn't joking about Michaela um, literally literally dry reaching these are these are very pungent these are beautiful mushrooms that i've been growing at home i love growing these kits i've got a few different types these are oysters and um this is the the giant oyster which uh i've got an endless supply of these are the what they call gray oyster or to be honest it's just oyster um i've got a yellow and i've also got a uh, a pink sometimes that i can get my hands on but the one that i'm really excited about is, is these guys here and i'll just show you so those are the shiitake the japanese mushroom absolutely amazing when you cook them and use them in uh recipes things like um stir fries soups risottos um the flavors are really strong and that's that pungent smell that we're actually experiencing in here I, I it really is very very strong and some people love to eat them raw um somebody like michaela was probably going to do that or jimmy jimmy's uh, just about a vegetarian anyway so he would probably eat them raw but i tend to find they're a lot better when they've been cooked so much better um so my sort of plant of the week is sort of mushrooms, but I also bought this one in because I wanted to show you this is one plant you'll find in your local garden center. I'm going to bring it right up close for you to have a look at. It's called stevia. And if you're looking to reduce your blood sugar levels, um, this is the plant to go for. Now, it's got these, it's a, it's a little herb. It's got these tiny little leaves, no flavor to them but incredibly sweet. In fact, 30 times sweeter than sugar. But what makes this so special, and I'm just getting a big big rush for, of sweetness right now, but what makes this so special is that it has no calories, zero calories. So if you add this into your tea or coffee as an alternative to sugar, you're gonna reduce your blood sugar levels. And now is the time to be planting it. So stevia, it's part of the Renaissance herb collection. I get them grown locally over here by Swan Valley Nursery. Um, but really, have a look one more time. There you go. Stevia, sweet. Michaela's about to um, probably gobble up most of those leaves, I would suspect now. You know, she's like, Jimmy's having one. It's super sweet, but it is really, really good for you. Okay. Shall we keep rolling along? Because we've got lots of questions and we're never going to answer them all. And I am going to cut us right on time today. So I've got seven minutes. Here we go. Carolyn is in Melbourne. I've got daffodils in a half wine barrel and have had a great display. Do I lift them or leave them in the barrel? Carolyn, leave them in the barrel. Um, if they produced flowers and you've got the flower stalk and you've got a seed head, cut that bit off, all right? Because instead of putting the energy into the seed, it'll then take all the energy down and store it in the bulb. Those will probably keep growing Christmas, maybe into January. Once they start to die back or yellow off, just cut them off at ground level and you can leave your daffs to rest after that. It'll do them the world of good. Claire is from Caversham in Perth, one of my favourite places. We're about to do a whole bunch of stories there at the Caversham Wildlife Park. It's a great spot. Um, Claire, let's have a, what are the best tropical plants to go to go by pools? Okay, you want to do it in pots as well. Ones that won't drop too many leaves or make a mess. Well, palms, if you're looking for the tropical look, palms are fantastic. They really are a great way to go. Um, golden cane palms are probably the best for uh, placing in pots. And now is the time to actually get your hands on them and get them growing. The, the real key here with these kinds of plants is fertilizer. When they're in pots, they grow 
and use a lot of energy. So you need to be feeding them all the time. So controlled release fertilizers like Osmocote, great way to go. Um, Libby is in Melbourne. Uh, hello, Libby. My black currant plant looks unhealthy. The leaves are withering. What could be wrong with it? Libby, this is, uh, this is a bit of a worry actually, because this is something that um, usually happens to black currants when they've got a root rot disease. Now you could be applying Yates anti-rot um, and soaking the ground. It is possible that it could be that. There's a couple of other um, fungicides that are designed for, for root rots, but it depends on how far gone your black currant is. So I would act today, um, get my hands on some and soak the ground, or I would pull the plant out and I would dispose of it. I wouldn't put it into compost. Um, dispose of it and I wouldn't plant anything in the same immediate vicinity of that area. So hopefully that's a solution. Brooke is in North Queensland in Bowen. Um, should I plant gladioli bulbs now or hold off till next winter? Uh, if you're going to plant them, get them in the ground right now. Holding off till next winter, they will come back, but it is a bit of a struggle. So it can be quite difficult. Gladys uh, will grow very, very quickly if you get them in the ground now. Yvette is in Melrose in South Australia. I think it's our first South Australian question today. Yvette, lovely to have you join us. Uh, can you use dried gum leaves as a mulch? Yeah, a lot of people sort of say, shouldn't shouldn't use gum foliage. Um, and the reason is because it's rich in oils. Okay, so those, those gums, the leaves break down a lot slower, but they do break down. So you can use it as a mulch. If you want to break them down quicker, you can add something like chicken manure to it and you mix some mix some manure through it and you'll find that it'll really compost quite quickly and it makes a really good mulch. So there's no big issues there. Okay, I think we've gone as far as we can go today, unfortunately. Um, Mercaela is going to send you uh, a message to our winners of the packet seeds. Uh, she'll do that straight after the show, I'm sure. The Garden Gurus, of course, is playing currently on Channel 9. Every Saturday, check your local TV guide so you don't miss it. We've got some great episodes coming up. As you saw, Darren Senor is arriving this week with a with a great project, so it's something to look forward to. If there's any information from... Uh, well, if there's any information you want, full stop, to be quite honest, head to our webpage. It's a great source. It is thegardengurus.tv. It's a terrific reference tool. Or if you want to watch some of our past episodes or some of our videos, go to our YouTube channel. It's thegardengurus.tv. And you can listen back to today's live stream and catch up on previous episodes. You do that by going to Spotify, Apple Podcast and Audible. And the good news is we're back next Monday for another session of The Garden Gurus Live. It's 12 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time and 9 a.m. for WA viewers. I hope you guys have enjoyed today's session. Big thanks to Michaela and Jimmy for producing and managing everything today. And we've got a big week ahead of us. So happy gardening, everyone. I look forward to seeing you soon. This show is brought to you by The Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com.